Good morning, everybody present here today in this hearing. I would like to open this hearing, the ninth hearing of the 183rd period of session of the IACHR, which it deals with the situation of human rights of Haitian people, of human mobility in the region, and who, which was requested by 96 organizations of the civil society. My name is Estuardo Rallon. I am the first vice president of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights and Rapporteur for Haiti. And today I am joined by the second vice president, Commissioner Margaret May McCauley, and the commissioners Joel Hernandez, the rapporteur for migrant people, and Commissioner Roberta Clark. Furthermore, we have the executive secretary for, uh, for um, monitoring, Maria Claudia Pulido, and the rapporteur for environmental, cultural, and social rights, Maria Soledad Garcia Munoz. I would like to greet everybody who are here present today on the side of the civil society, and I would like to explain the time allocation. In this hearing, we will have a first uh, space of uh, 20 minutes for the civil society to make comments on these topics, then we will have 30 more minutes for the Inter-American Commission to react to their interventions and to make some questions and at the end of the hearing the 30 last minutes we will have comments by the civil society and the closing by the commission finally some other indications we have a digital tool to measure time it will um we will see the time there we also have language interpretation, and we also have subtitles. These hearings are public, they are uh, streamlined, and the recording is available in the YouTube channel of the Commission in its original language and in English. Without further ado, I would like to start with the hearing, and I would like to give the floor to the civil society for 30 minutes. We can see the slides, but we cannot hear you. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you so much, commissioners. Uh, just a reminder that this is a multilingual hearing, so please find the language channel that you need. And I'll just give a moment for people to, to get adjusted. Okay, my name is Melanie Alain. I'm the founder of Freedom Imaginaries in Jamaica and I'll be presenting in English. I'm joined by Leo Bianemi from the Haitian organization Centre de Réflexion et de Recherche sur la Migration et l'Environnement, Caroline Joseph from Haitian Bridge Alliance, Pascal Solage from Neige Maman and New Pap Domi, representatives from the Haiti Support Group, Myrta Desulmi, Danuta Radzik, and Charlene Wilkinson and others, and Mondi Metalus, a Haitian journalist and refugee. We are honored to participate in this hearing on the situation of human rights of Haitian people in human mobility in the region. The timeliness of this hearing cannot be overstated. In, in the past year, there has been an intensification in the migration of Haitians across the Americas in conditions of danger and extreme violence. Some of these Haitians are fleeing the significant political turmoil and natural disasters in Haiti in 2021. However, many are part of a generation of Haitians who migrated after the 2010 earthquake to states such as Brazil and Chile, and who are moving further north as conditions in these countries become increasingly inhospitable. In response to these movements, states across the Americas have initiated brutal measures of repression and deterrence to discourage new arrivals of Haitian migrants. These measures in turn have given room to abusive practices on the part of unscrupulous criminals and state authorities who seek to exploit the situation for personal gain. 
In this context, the purpose of this hearing is to provide testimony about the escalating cycle of migration related abuses and torture that Haitians face on their long and harrowing journey across the Americas. Today's testimony will focus on three major trends. First, the summary expulsion of Haitians without access to asylum procedures. Second, shocking levels of violence and discrimination against Haitian migrants, including sexual and gender-based violence, extortion, disappearances, and unidentified remains. And third, criminalization and detention of Haitian migrants in deplorable and inhumane conditions. These issues are not isolated, rather they are structural and take place within a context of anti-Black racism that normalizes the persecution of Black migrants in every corner of the world, from the United States to Ukraine. These issues are also intersectional since Haitian women and girls are particularly vulnerable to egregious violations of their human rights. So before addressing these themes, I now hand over to Leo Bianemi, who will describe the structural context shaping mobility in the region, and he will present his, his, his speech in French. Leo? Merci, Marileni. Bonjour. Je vais présenter sur la violence Good, et mord. La... Good morning, uh, Maleni. I'm going to speak about the uh, situations of political, economic, and social crisis faced by Haiti. For years, so we have been exposed to situations of this type of crisis, supported by strong acts of violence, corruption, and impunity. Democratic institutions and the judicial system are on their knees. The systematic violation of human rights, the multiplication of armed gangs, rape, kidnapping, and serial massacres constitute the calamities to which society is prey. The assassination of the former President Jovenel Moise on July 7, 2021 is also a major element that reinforces the crisis. Not to mention the earthquake of August 14, 2021. So since June 20, June the 1st, 2021, citizens have been displaced as they flee the violent clashes between rival gangs in Martison and Montanara. UNICEF counts 1,889 people housed at the Centre Sportif de Carrefour, among them 446 children and 50, 582 women and girls living in very precarious conditions. All of these factors are causing the accelerating emigration of Haitians to Latin American and Caribbean countries in appalling and suicidal conditions. As shown in the image on your screen, the main migration routes go uh, across South America from Brazil, Chile, and Guyana, where migrants enter and leave before transiti uh, transiting across the continent to the north. Migration flows through Venezuela and Colombia or through the Andean corridor, crossing the, the dangerous Darien Gap to Central America, Mexico, and the United States. According to the International Organization for Migration, irregular migration through the Americas, primarily to the United States and Mexico, has increased significantly. Haitian nationals are the majority group to undertake this long and perilous journey. This trend is increasing the number of border crossers and asylum seekers in various countries in the region. OI IOM reports that between January and October 2021, approximately 100,000 migrants crossed the Darien Gap. 62% of women were Haitians, uh, compared to 23% in 2020. In October 2021, 800 to 1,000 migrants were crossing daily, moving north to join the estimated 20,000 to 25,000 5,000 Haitians in transit through Mexico. The Mexican Commission for Refugee Assistance reports that the number of Haitians seeking ref refugee or asylum status increased from 5,500 in 2019 to more than 51,000 in 2021. These 
um, Haitian migrants are fleeing major political crisis and natural disasters in 2021. However, many have migrated since the 2010 earthquake. Many Haitians first tried to settle in Brazil and then in Chile. According to several statistics, the Haitian population is estimated at about 237,000 in Chile and 143,000 in Brazil. However, as one of our speakers will describe, many of them gradually abandoned this migratory project to go to the northern countries as local conditions became more and more inhospitable. The economic downturn and loss of employment, discrimination, and especially anti-immigrant policies in these countries have driven migrants to the United States of America. As we will discuss today, this complex migration crisis in the region exposes Haitian migrants to gross human rights violations. These abuses include mass and summary deportations, shocking levels of violence and discrimination, and arbitrary arrests and detentions as states in the region adopt racist and signophobic policies targeting Haitian migrants. Now I give the floor to Gerlin Joseph, who is going to deal with the subject of summary expulsions of Haitians. Uh, hello, and thank you very much. La réalité des immigrants. The entire South and Central America making a journey to the United States Mexico border. You have heard the reason why people were forced to flee home. And I would like to highlight a poem by one of the great Ethiopians saying, When, when home is in the mouth of a shark. And we all understand what that means. To see people being unable to stay at home, to see people displaced due to political turmoil, due to uh, um, nat natural disasters, forcing them to flee. And we, we heard from Leo the reality of people in search of freedom. We clearly understand that human mobility when it comes to Black immigrants, there is nowhere for us to be safe. We are not safe at home. We are not safe in the journey. We are not safe when we reach to our quote unquote destination. To date, the United States have expelled close to 21,000 people to Haiti, including pregnant women and infants as young as just a couple of days old. That is what we call in external violence. We understand what's happening on the ground to be internal violence, but we also see that those internal violences are due mainly to external violence and literally what we see happening in Haiti concerning the West, concerning the international community. We also heard about the dangerous journey from the Darien Gap and we understand the many lives that have been lost, we will never know. So today we want people to understand, we must hear them, see them, and let them know that we are here for them. This weekend, I am preparing to once again bury a young woman, barely 18 years old, who was forced to stay in Mexico due to MPP in Title 42. So we are once again, standing against the use of Title 42 to continue to destroy the lives of people who are extremely vulnerable. And we also want to highlight that the very idea of border only applies to the extreme vulnerable and those who are in need. Those who are privileged, those who have enough money, borders do not apply to them. As people are, are, are coming to the US-Mexico border, we understand in September, we all saw what happened. The world watched, the world continued to watch, and the world is silent. And we will tell you that the treatment of those people in US custody 
where men and women and children have been forced to spend up to 13 days without access to hygiene, without access to even brush their teeth. And then to be shackled, put on a plane and sent for most of them not even returned because a lot of those children were born due to the fact that they were forced to stay in Mexico, shackled, mistreated, and then dropped in Haiti without any assistance, without any follow-up, without any accountability. That is why we at the Haitian Bridge Alliance have filed a lawsuit against President Biden and the administration to hold him, at, to hold him accountable for what we all witness in the Rio and make sure that no matter where people are moving from, whether it is Ukraine, Guatemala, Panama, or Haiti, that that never repeats. So we will continue to hold all people accountable, especially people who are in leadership, to make sure that human mobility are not criminalized and Black people, specifically Haitian men, women, and children, have the freedom to move and the freedom to seek asylum. Thank you so much. And I will pass to Ms. Pascal. Bonjour, merci, Gerlin. Je vais maintenant aborder la question de la violence. Good de morning, la... thank you. I will now address violence and discrimination. Haitian migrants who make the terrifying journey across the Americas experience extreme violence and discrimination. They are victims of brutal attacks, disappearances, sexual abuse, human trafficking, and excessive use of force during immigration operations. The situation is part of a larger structural context of anti-Black racism in the Americas, including racist and xenophobic migration policies that seek to persecute Black migrants. Haitian women and girls in situation of human mobility are particularly vulnerable due to the intersecting forms of discrimination they face as Black Haitian migrants. The Dominican Republic illustrates the gendered and intersectional dimensions of this issue. The mass deportation of migrants in subhuman conditions has taken another turn in the Dominican Republic for some time. Pregnant women have been targeted by Dominican authorities, even in hospitals. Approximately 1,700 Haitian migrants have been deported, including 153 pregnant women, nine nursing mothers, and 128 children in subhuman conditions as of November 2021, according to Serremen. I will share with you the testimonies of two women and a girl under other names who were welcomed at the Belader border in November 2021. Katie is a 20-year-old mother of two from Port de Paix. She is one of the pregnant women arrested inside a hospital in Dominican Republic. She described the events and violence she experienced during her deportation. She testifies, the immigration agents arrested me on November 9 and 6.30 a.m. in the hospital. After my arrest, they visited several other hospitals to find other Haitian women. I arrived in Haina at two in the afternoon. I had not eaten anything all day. We were served poor quality food at 7 p.m. The sanitary conditions were deplorable. I slept on the floor. The next day, they took us to the border. It was hot and I was thirsty. There were no toilets to relieve us. I was carrying a baby and I was on the verge of fainting. Pamela has been living in Dominican Republic for three years. She is 23 years old and originally from Gonaive. She used to work as an informal trader in Dominican Republic. She left to have better living conditions. As Gerlin said, our country cannot ensure security today. She had no legal status. She was deported on November 9. She was arrested inside a hospital like many other pregnant women. She was seven months pregnant. And she tells us, 
at 6 a.m. in the morning, they arrested me in the hospital. At the time of the deportation, there were 60 pregnant women in a bus friend with iron. Some of them threw up the whole way because the roads were bumpy and the drivers were driving ruthlessly. We were screaming and crying. The drivers were cursing at us. In July 2021, Serremen received a 15-year-old girl. She testified that a Dominican military officer raped her on the way to deport her to Haiti. Minors are deported in subhuman conditions without any consideration for their age. The conditions of detention and deportation. Women suffered from a rape, from emotional rape during their deportation to Haiti. The conditions of detention and deportation of migrants in Dominican Republic do not in any way respect human rights and human dignity, especially for women and pregnant women. I now turn the floor to Sayada Shield, who will tell us about the experience with discrimination and violence in Brazil, and then the journey through the Darien Gap in Panama. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pascal. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mirta Desulme. I will be speaking in English. I'm speaking on behalf of Stael Achille, who is a Haitian refugee, who is having some health problems due to the aggressions that he encountered on his journey. Stael Achille fled Haiti in 2016 and traveled to Brazil because his life was threatened due to political persecution. Like many other Haitian migrants, he faced exploitation and abuse in Brazil, where he worked for slave wages at a construction company and experienced an increasingly inhospitable environment. In August 2021, Style began his travel from Brazil on the same day as a caravan of 14,000 migrants, including 150 Haitians. They traveled through Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia until they reached Panama's frightful Darien Gap in September 2021. The group had gotten separated because they had to use different boats to cross 162 rivers. There were about 55 Haitians left in Sayel's group. They traveled for 45 days and walked for seven days from Colombia to Panama. They came across several dead bodies on their path. At one point, they encountered a toddler sitting by her dying mother. The mother had been stabbed. They could not help her, so they took the child with them. When they reached the Darien Gap, they encountered some criminals who beat and robbed them. They beat them up badly, including 14 pregnant women who were with them. Stiles' own wife was also pregnant and was also beaten. They raped the women and sodomized some men. Right before the migrants' very eyes, they raped an 11-year-old girl and murdered three Haitians who had refused to give up their money. Stael also watched as 14 men raped one woman. When they finally arrived at the Panamanian military base, they thought that they were finally going to take a breather and find some protection at long last. They met another group of migrants who told them that they, they had also encountered the bandits who had killed seven of them five Venezuelans and two Haitians. At around seven in the evening, the soldiers came out of the camp and told them that they would not be able to sleep where they had opened their tents because water ran through that area. They forced them to go and sleep in a banana plantation field where there were snakes. They said that they had to leave their belongings behind. Style had all of his documents in his suitcase. He told them that he could not leave his belongings behind if water was going to run through the area. This is when they started beating him up, kicking him and gun-butting gun him. He did not want to go into the banana plantation because soldiers and bandits routinely kill migrants in the plantation fields and bury them there. But they were forced to go and sleep there even though it was raining. After the soldiers left, Style remained on the ground, bloody, suffering and in pain. The next morning, when they returned from the field to look for their tents, they saw that the soldiers had stolen everything. When they entered the military base to get their passes from the immigration office, they realized that the first bandits who had attacked them were soldiers who had taken off their uniforms. Due to the fact that the 11-year-old girl's mother tried to report the soldiers who had raped her daughter and stolen her phone to the military authorities, they came for her in the night and took her into the plantation field and she was never seen again. 
When it was time for the migrants to take the boat to continue their journey, the soldiers demanded that everyone pay $15 in order to be allowed to get on the boat, even though they knew that they had no money because they had stolen it themselves. They then forced them to work as payment for the boat. Stael is now in Costa Rica, fearing going any further due to the extreme brutality and deportations meted out to Haitian migrants in Mexico and the US border. As a result of the beatings, he is constantly spitting up blood and his wife is also sick because due to the beatings, she had a miscarriage when she was five months pregnant. Doctors have told Stahel that his lungs have been severely damaged by the beatings. Neither Stahel nor his wife are fit to work, but even though he's in constant pain, he has still been forced to search for work. He has not been able to find any work or get any assistance for that matter. Well, I thank you, Rita. Sorry, go ahead. I will now pass uh, the floor to Mondi Metelus. Merci. Moi, c'est Metelus Mondi, réfugié politique haïtien. Thank you very much. I am Mathieu Mundy, a journalist. I am the president of Force Organisé dans l'Union. I had to leave Haiti to take refuge in France in 2019 because those who wanted to, to kill me, quench my breath, were economically and politically powerful. Matelus, uh, on November 6, 2020, and uh, the immigration agents of that country uh, said uh, it, it's on, it, they went to hotel and uh, then they um, arrived uh, and 14 other, 20 other Haitians were taken into custody. And finally, a few days after, I learned that my child had been separated from my companion, Madame Miriam Vieux. Guyane State puts them in a children's child center where they will live in hell for almost a month. Not only are the the other children in the center beaten, they give me a vaccine without my permission. They eat badly because they are not familiar with Guyana food. Worst of all, they do not provide interpreters to help them pass the message of thirst or hunger. Immigration agents and police stole their jewelry and tablets. At one point, he was forced to enter Guyana illegally. On the way, my taxi driver conspired with the police to beat me and take all my money. When I arrived in the capital, Guyana, where my children were being held, they did not let me see their children. There is no Haitian consulate in Guyana to help me or any other Haitian in need. Although I wrote the Guyanese government accusing me of receiving my letter, I never received the answers of contacted my chill. One month after the rest, they were released from the streets of Georgetown without any accompaniment or excuse, and they went to UCS. My children are traumatized. Many other Haitians suffer greatly. There are six year old women who have just been released on a plane to Brazil. Haitian trafficking is taking place in the Caribbean where human rights abuses must end. So within all this situation, I couldn't um, go forward. My objective was uh, to make my child to Guyana. When I went to the Guyanese government, uh, they didn't allow me to talk to my child or even to, to see him. And one month later, they decided to, uh, liber to liberate my, my child and uh, different organizations and my lawyer decided to set free the children and they left it in the streets without any explanation. So it is for all this violence that my children suffered. Today, however, 
my child is with me and friends, but he continues to suffer from consequences, the night he has nightmares because he always remembers what happened in the detention centers in Guyana. So I would like to seize the opportunity to speak to the panel of this commission to ask for justice and reparation, not only for myself and my two children, but for the other 14 patients who have experienced those uh, terrible moments. Thank you very much, Mondi. Merci en pile uh, for your testimony. And Mondi's testimony highlights the criminalization and detention of Haitian migrants in inhumane conditions, including children. And I see now that we have two and a half minutes left. So in that time, I just like to thank the commission for having this hearing. And in light of the serious and urgent issues we've highlighted today, we ask the commission to take the steps set out in our written submission. And in the time that we have left, I'll only highlight a few of them. We ask the commission to prepare a thematic report on the human rights situation of Haitian people in human mobility. Ensure that Haitian migrants have equal access to inter-American mechanisms. Demand that the UN Refugee Agency do the same and also develop guidance on international protection considerations for Haitians. Demand that states immediately end abusive practices and policies that target Haitian migrants including Title 42 expulsions in the United States. Ensure Haitian migrants who have suffered human rights violations have access to remedies, including compensation. In the case of victims of sexual and gender-based violence, ensure they have access to high quality medical care and support. Demand that CARICOM member states comply with their obligations under the regional treaty with respect to the free movement of Haitian nationals urge states to accede to the Refugee Convention and Protocol and adopt national refugee legislation. And finally, demand that Haiti provide consular protection for citizens residing abroad. Thank you very much, commissioners. I hand back over to you. Muchas gracias. Muy amable, voy a dar inicio. Thank you. We will start with the 20 minutes that the Commission has to make comments. As country reporter, I will speak first. I would first like to say that it's really important for this hearing to take place during the period of session that this makes visible a drastic situation, an unfortunate situation, which entails a commitment from the Commission to take action in order to support them in the respect of human rights for Haitians in mobility situation. I would also like to congratulate the organizations of the civil society due to their presentations. They have explain thoroughly the different perspectives of these, uh, the dramatic situations of these people facing human mobility. I would like to say that the Caribbean is addressed by the commission and we would like that in the strategic plan that we are drafting for the next few years, we would like to prioritize the Caribbean actions where this struggle against human rights with human mobility is also present. It's a pleasure for the commission to have two commissioners from the Caribbean. We are joined today by Margaret May McCauley and Roberta Clark, who undoubtedly will enrich our work in the Commission so as to address these challenges in the correct way. Today, you have spoken about topic related to massive deportations, violence, criminalization, and terrible detention situations. The examples that you have provided us 
especially in terms of the deportations with specific data in the US, 21,000 exportations. We saw images of uh, the border patrol in an incident with Haitian people that the commission condemned some some months ago. Then we had testimonies as how in the Domen Dominican Republic there was an attack on pregnant women, people who were subject to uh, beatings with very difficult situations and this cruel treatment is given in different countries the same as the last testimony related to Guyana. I would like to say that we are going to make this situation visible and we will deepen probably our rapporteur for persons in human mobility, Commissioner Joel Hernandez will speak about the different action lines in which we can collaborate. And we are at your disposal and we are totally committed with you. With your final petitions, well, you can uh, send them to us. We can have uh, contact with you, a fluent contact with you. When, once we receive those petitions, it's a commitment for us to react in a timely and adequate manner. So we would like to be closer to you so as to support you. And you can send them by written form. And if you would like to reflect upon any of those petitions, you can also do that. So without further ado, I will give the floor to the second vice president, Commissioner Margaret May Macaulay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, my warm greetings to um, my, uh, all the um, representatives of civil society who, uh, this who this morning have given us so much information about the situation of migrants and mobility in um, our region, um, over which we have a mandate of promotion and protection of human rights. Um, I also greet my colleagues, um, brother commissioner and sister commissioner, and also um, the staff um, of the commission who are present. I want to particularly and warmly greet Malini Aline for being present, and, and I wish her all and her members all success in their work. Um, I, I am always seriously concerned and upset when, whenever we have hearings or meetings in relation to the Haitian situation and Haitian peoples. As the, as the rapporteur, country rapporteur for Dominican Republic, I, well, we have worked um, over the years. Um, unfortunately, I think Commissioner Esmeralda and myself are the only ones still present in the Commission who participated in the work um, with the Dominican Republic in relation to Haitian peoples uh, um, and their status in the Dominican Republic. Um, Last but not least, those who were born there, those, some of them who had um, attained the age of 30, 40, 50 since their birth in the DR, who had not, whose birth had not been registered and who had no birth papers or citizenship papers. And after several, many, many meetings, the commission did succeed in having some of these persons uh, granted their citizenship and birth 
uh, uh, documents. Didn't cover the large numbers, so. Um, but there was um, some success, and we continue to work on 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 this, this matter. And also a very painful and grievous, uh, um, in, in several painful and grievous incidents of Haitians crossing the border. With a push review, their their transportation chased from the border and caught up, and whenever they caught and so-called detained, they were summarily and would be summarily taken to the border and put across there. But having gone through incidents, many incidences of abuse of all kinds, this I encountered in. And uh, whilst I was a judge in the court and years before even being in the commission and going there. We also encountered, encountered Asian, Haitian migrants when we visited the border, uh, three or four border towns, uh, US border towns um, with um, Texas and Mexico. And at, spoke with all the officials who were involved with uh, migrants there and, uh, and visited detention centers and um, safe places run by civil society persons who uh, um, uh, would assist several persons. And one could not help but conclude and realize the large number of Haitians in need who were seeking to migrate to a safer place. I will not list all that you have already listed, um, which uh, has suffered in Haiti from natural disasters to human causational disasters against their fellow humans, and which push people to this uh, situation of desperation as for, uh, that forces them to leave their country. Um, we, we all know that and you've spoken in detail about that. Uh, it is clear, at least to, 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 from all discussions we've had, that we all have to assist about what is happening in, in Haiti. We have to first work with Haiti itself and the states of our region, and indeed, quite a large portion of the world, we must find the way by working in collaboration even more so, closer with the United Nations to force them to own and act on their historical responsibility towards Haiti, so that Haiti will recover itself as a strong, viable democratic state, which is able to deal with the criminal aspects within it, which is able to run its economy and political procedures in the way a, a, a successful or, or a, um, democratic country can. And of course, we have to work with the countries in our region to also act with conscience and human interest towards Haitians who cross their borders irregularly due to their desperation. We, we have to continue to do this. We do do this, but we have to try to do that even more so in the hopes that we will succeed and have better conditions um, for uh, um, any Haitian who crosses any border in the Americas um, irregularly. And, <clears throat> and we hope that you will continue to work with us by not waiting to have a meeting, which we welcome, but also to continuously send us 
information and to continuously urge us to act in relation to yeah. Haitians who are in dire need of every assistance that they could get. Um, I, I, I think I would leave it there. And if we do not use up all our time, I may be able to add some more thank you. Muchas gracias, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Commissioner. I will give the floor now to Commissioner Joel Hernandez, our reporter for human mobility. Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Uh, Chairman of the hearing. I would like to recognize the work of the civil societies present here in you had introduced 20 minutes, a very harsh reality, but also notorious of what is happening in Haiti in relation to people who are in situation of human mobility. I don't have to repeat what you have already eloquently expressed. The factors that are causing the, the deportation of Haitians something that is observed in Haiti in the last 20 years, but now is uh, really critical due to the different conditions in Haiti, but also in the rest of the continent with countries that are closed to the eyes of the of migration whenever it is needed, the migration crisis for Haiti, it's a 360 degrees crisis because it starts from Haiti itself, where social and economic security conditions, the vulnerability of human rights forces them to exit, but also it's a crisis for people who are uh, crossing borders and that are completely vulnerable vulnerable to abuses of authority, but also to before organized crime and to abuses by um, human traffickers that exploit with uh, human pain. But this is also a crisis of the long journey that you carry out, this map that you have Jonas, where they uh, go throughout all the continent from the Caribbean to South America, the Darian uh, cross, crossing South America and Mexico then to go to the US. And once they reach the country of destination, they are also subject to inhuman treatment and that are not respect, respectful of human dignity, such as these images of border patrol in the US with a horse uh, reaching Haiti and people that make us remember terrible images of, of the 19th or 20th century that we thought that did not exist any longer. This is why I'm saying this is a crisis of human mobility of 360 degrees. The numbers you have presented are evident in a very short uh, period. There have been an expulsion of 20,000 people. This is serious because their return to Haiti make these people in a vulnerable situation once again, living in poverty and having their human rights uh, infringed constantly and this and what is what the international community and the commission have to do this is a question that we ask ourselves once and once again at the commission this hearing is a first step in the correct direction i believe this is great to have had this regional hearing and to have uh, convened people coming from different areas of the civil society. 
It's also good to have a hearing with interpretation into Creole. This was a demand asked by the civil society in March 2020 when we were there at Port-au-Prince to be able to reach more people through the use of their own language. But also the commission has been uh, aware of the situation following the migrant situation of Haitians. We have done this through two mechanisms. The first, the most immediate one is the visibilization of the situation, the status of the migrant Haitians. It is one of our attributions according to uh, Article 43.1 of the American Convention to raise awareness in the continent related to the situation of human rights in the continent. We also have to uh, further increase our efforts to have full awareness of the situation of persons in a mobility situation. This, as I was saying, was is the first measure we can implement to exhibit the situation. And second, our work has to focus on uh, drafting inter-American standards on the matter of migration. It's development to be implemented in concrete situations and also to disseminate the standards, which are the result of the progressive uh, development of uh, human rights law. In December 2019, the Inter-American Commission adopted the uh, human mobility inter-American principles, which are our basis for all types of works to monitor this situation. More recently, in October last year, the Commission adopted Resolution 2 2021 called the Protection of Haitian uh, People in human mobility, inter-American solidarity. This is a resolution that applies inter-American principles to, these, to this concrete situation. Here, what we have to do is to focus particularly on the humanitarian situation at the borders. This chapter of the resolution establishes the measures that the states should adopt to provide human security for people who are at the border crossings. Let me, let me just mention one of the tasks that we are under, we are carrying out. The resolution uh, establishes uh, international principles or echoes basic uh, principles such as the non-discrimination and equality principle and also resorts to different uh, documents to have international solidarity. Uh, a call to the whole of the international community to come to the aid of these migrants. So how can I conclude my intervention? There is an international shared responsibility of all countries from this continent, which must act to help the migrants in human mobility. That responsibility shared an international responsibility has to do with recognizing the vulnerability of Haitians in human mobility first and second to recognize or acknowledge their right to request asylum or seek asylum, such as in Haiti. In Haiti, they are at their own country, living very dangerous situations and their personal integrity is at risk. So the non refoulement uh, principle should should prevail that is the state the states have to act more expeditiously to take into account intersectionality and thus they should provide strengthen uh, strengthened efforts for people at 
in vulnerable situations such as migrant women or women with children who are in human mobility. This is where I think there must be awareness in the whole continent. This is a situation of vulnerability of 360 degrees, so there must be a mobilization of the whole of the international community to understand the situation of Haitian men and women in this long, long migration journey coming from poverty, but which seeks to achieve a better situation for the Haitians and their families. I conclude here, Mr. President, with a commitment as the Commission. We must do more to make visible the situation of migrant people from Haiti and to mobilize the international community for to, to come to their aid. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I give the floor to Commissioner Roberta Clark. You have the floor. Thank you, President Arlon. Um, and good morning, uh, all representatives of civil society, as well as my Inter-American Commission colleagues. Um, it's, I thank, want to thank you for your thoughtful analysis, for your description of the harm is being experienced um, across the in the mig in the migratory flows. It was very hard to listen to, but it has to be said. It has to be heard by many, many more people. So I I, I welcome the opportunity to um, to to live of this dialogue and also to use the voice of the commission, my own voice in amplifying some of what you've uh, shared with us today. I think it's impossible to speak about Haiti without acknowledging the historical discrimination that Haitian peoples face, the, the reprisals that they have experienced since they had the courage and the daring to liberate themselves from slavery in the Haitian Revolution. Um, and they've been experiencing the, uh, since, since then, patterns of exploitation, extraction, oppression, and even and an indifference to the human suffering that this has uh, that this pattern has has wrought, and so when we think about addressing the extreme abuses that have been experienced by Haitians in the in the in the in the context of human mobility, I think we have to start with thinking about how the Commission can uh, can 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 have a role in sort of addressing the rule of law. Um, governance breakdowns within the demo, democratic breakdowns within Haiti. I think it starts there uh, because we do have to get to the the cause of the of human mobility uh, and the crisis of that. So I think that's one one set of, of work which has to continue um, uh, by the Commission, of course, by all the multilateral actors and and by uh, the Caribbean um, civil society and member states who are. Some well, member states are not here, but civil society members who are here today. Um, two things were said by uh, by by you, representative civil society, that that will stay with me. And um, one is that there's nowhere safe for Haitians, whether at home or along the journey or in the destination. And secondly, the idea that the idea of a border applies only to those who are discriminated against, the poor and the disprivileged. Ideas of borders don't apply to people with wealth and affluence and who are not, um, don't have those identities that attract um, uh, discrimination and violence. I think these are two ideas that, that we have to, two conceptualizations that help us think through how systematic and structural um, the issues of abuse against Haitians are within their borders, but also outside of their borders as they move for refuge and safety and personal advancement. Um, I think what you all have described. Uh, around the abuses experienced by persons in the crossings or in the movement show quite clearly patterns of complicity between state and non-state actors, as well as extreme patterns of impunity for the harm suffered by Haitians. Um, and so, you know, the harms include forced disappearances, which have a very specific um, definition uh, within the inter-American human rights system. And what we have heard here is a pattern including forced disappearances where we have um, allegations of, of state actors um, colluding with non-state actors, bandits, gangs uh, to harm 
patients in the course of movement. So I think that's something that we have to, to think about very seriously and think about how we address. I just want to end by saying, I've heard that the, the request, um, the seven or eight uh, recommendations, strong recommendations made by civil society organizations here. And uh, I want to assure you that we will be taking these recommendations into the strategic planning um, uh, for the Inter-American Commission over the next five years. But certainly I think the idea of a thematic report is very important. Um, and also using the voice of the commission to the voice and the analysis of the commission to advance protection of Haitians and to end discriminatory practices um, for persons uh, moving. I just wanna end by saying, the Inter-American Commission has elaborated very clearly the principles that are at work here. One principle being equality and non-discrimination. The second one, non-refoulement, including the prohibition of rejection at the border without a process, a due process of hearing. Thirdly, no sanction for irregular entry or stay, so responding to the criminalization that you all have brought to our attention, and also the prohibition of collective expulsions, which of course itself um, is arbitrary and does not um, accord with the principle of the hearing to, to address uh, persons who are seeking asylum, refuge, or refugee status. Uh, so I just want to thank you very much, um, and I turn it back over to you, um, uh, Commissioner Rallon, for your uh, chairing. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Commissioner. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I would like now to uh, make a small change to use three minutes uh, for the closing and to use them now to give the floor to our special reporter, Soledad Garcia Munoz, to hear her at this hearing. So I give her the floor for four minutes. Thank you very much, uh, President, for your generous uh, allowance of this three minutes. I will try to be very brief because the commission has already mentioned the important points at this hearing. I wanted to thank the opportunity to share this hearing with the commission and to deeply thank the social society for their contributions, which show a tragedy, a humanitarian tragedy that is marked by racism and also by the phobia or the fear and hatred against people who are forced to flee their countries, not only by violence, but also by poverty, inequality, and as you very well said, because of uh, na natural disasters and climate change, which unfortunately will make more and more people being forced to flee their countries, especially at the Caribbean. This is why we are working hand in hand with the commission and especially uh, as regards its strategy with the Caribbean to make visible not only the consequences, but also the causes of the of human mobility. I would like to only uh, make a request to civil society, please all context information related to the causes and your prognosis uh, on this, which can make migratory uh, make migration fluxes even larger i would like to receive all that information and also bring to the table that this mobility is taking place in a pandemic context that is why it would be very important to receive information on the impact on the pandemic on the whole migration journey for haitians both in relation to healthcare assistance or access to vaccines and also to warn on the information related to the treatment of pregnant women to sexual rape, uh, which of course attempt attack this women's health. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you, Rapporteur. So now we are on the final part of this hearing. I will give the floor now to the civil society once more for your comments and reactions for 25 minutes. Well, thank you very much, Commissioners, first for granting this hearing and also for your strong commitment articulated to the Haitian people and your recognition of the historical context of racial persecution, the historical roots 
of the situation now, and also for welcoming the recommendations that we've made, and in particular, the idea of a thematic report. Um, thank you again, and, and we appreciate the platform to amplify these stories through the Inter-American Commission and its, its various platforms. Um, since there were no specific questions, we're just going to make some additional comments on and, and provide updates on specific situations. So I will now hand over to Gerline Joseph from the Haitian Bridge Alliance, who will provide an update on the recent arrivals by boat and what's happening on that front, arrivals by Haitians. So um, Gerline. Thank you uh, so very much. And thank you for your comments and thank you for really allowing us to share and we receive and we are really hoping and looking forward to continue working with you to make sure that all people are protected, especially people who are migrating from Haiti, traversing all the different countries, understanding that anti-Black racism is not a US phenomenon. It's a space that we see and we acknowledge that exists throughout the world, throughout South and Central America. So we are asking as people are traversing and passing through countries in South and Central America, that they are too protected, provided protection, provided support, and treated as human being. I want to highlight that since the assassination of President Jovenel Moise, that was followed by the earthquake and then natural, and then um, the storm that really pushed people out of the South. We saw an increased number of people taking the dangerous voyage via boats to Florida. Last week, nine children died near Puerto Rico, and it is heartbreaking to see how the United States responded by simply returning the survivors to Haiti. Over 500 people have already been returned to Haiti from the United States. And those who have not yet been returned, we understand are still in CBP custody or ICE detention centers where they are unable to have access to legal protection and access to community support. We also see that uh, people are being deported and expelled from Cuba, from the Bahamas, many different French Antilles. And we are seeing that there is again, no protection, no matter where Haitians find themselves and piggyback on the reality of the historical context of Haiti, that Haiti should not have existed. The very idea of Haiti is unacceptable. The very existence of us as a people is unacceptable. And we do understand that is a major factor on how the world responds to Haitian migration and how both internal violence and external, and external violence continue to be a major factor as well. Um, we are also making sure that when we speak about climate change and climate migration, that the Haiti and the people of Haiti are included because that is the reality. And we want to make sure that the narratives and voices and presence of those realities are, are, are at every aspect and level when we speak at human, when we speak of human mobility, make sure that we center those voices. I uh, thank you so much and I will pass it back to Meline. Thank you so much, Gerline. And following on from Gerline, I'll ask Pascal Solage to add additional comments, particularly on the vulnerability of, of Haitian women and girls. Pascal? Alors, uh, bonjour. Moi, je voulais un petit peu faire Good des morning. I wanted to make some comments on what I said before as regards the women that were expelled from Dominican Republic. Uh, we have to remember that uh, Haiti has a high rate of uh, a mother's uh, death rate. Uh, women who are poor, they are highly exposed and vulnerable when they are pregnant in Haiti. So when they are repatriated to Haiti, there's, their lives are in risk in Haiti. So uh, no, we have, we have 
uh, families that are only led by um, women. They are the ones who are responsible for the, uh, their uh, family's livelihood. Therefore, they are highly vulnerable as well. And in this party, part of the world, we have many conflicts. We have a political, economic, social, and security crisis. One third of, of our territory is uh, facing a very uh, complex situation. The metropolitan area uh, is affected by the action of uh, many guns. And uh, uh, we also have uh, heard of a um, an article written by a journalist who described how women were raped and uh, they were also kidnapped. Uh, someone in the south of the capital, uh, and uh, you, you know that sometimes we cannot go to other parties of the uh, country, so uh, women are kept kidnapped and isolated by those armed gangs. So this situation is highly critical today, uh, given the crisis we're going through in Haiti. Their security is really poor. So when we see how women are treated, remember that we have a historical background and uh, the commission should address this problem at all levels. And thank you very much for your attention. Merci beaucoup, Pascal. The final comment I will make is about the situation in CARICOM countries right now. I think the situation of Haitian migrants in North and Central America, for example, is, is increasingly well-documented, but there is a deteriorating, deteriorating situation in CARICOM countries right now with respect to how Haitian migrants are being treated. And just to give you some context, uh, in the CARICOM region, the revised Treaty of Chagoramas, which is the regional treaty, um, recognizes the rights of all CARICOM nationals, including Haitians, you know, the right of hassle-free entry and an automatic six-month stay upon entry into a CARICOM member state. So that is their right under the revised Treaty of Chagoramas. However, recently, a number of CARICOM states have arbitrarily stripped Haitian migrants of this right, exposing them to flagrant violations of their human rights. And so we highlighted the case of Guyana in our testimony, for example, from Mondi. Um, in Guyana, the government has initiated a campaign of repression and deterrence that targets Haitian migrants for discriminatory treatment, including through detention in inhumane conditions. And we heard about, you know, Mondi's case. His case was about, you know, the, the arbitrary arrest and detention of 26 Haitians, including children, for over one month after they legally entered Guyana by air. They were rounded up in the middle of the night and, and detained. Um, but, you know, there are other cases coming out of Guyana and other CARICOM countries in early 2021, for example, a Haitian couple was arrested in Guyana within hours of crossing the Lethem border into Guyana. And they were detained for over two weeks in deplorable conditions before being brought to a judge. Um, one of them was reportedly held in a cell, in a filthy cell with human feces on the floor and no mattress. And the Haitian couple was subsequently fined and sentenced to one year imprisonment and deportation simply for failing to secure an entry stamp in their passport. And this deportation order was upheld even though the Haitian couple expressed during the hearing a fear of returning to Haiti. Other Haitian migrants report being returned to their port of embarkation after landing at the airport in Guyana. And yet others describe being abused and exploited by a network of criminals and state authorities who take advantage of their vulnerable situation. And so I welcome the observations of the commission about the complicity and you know, this network of state and non-state actors acting together you know, to exploit a, a situation of crisis. And of course, as we recognized and discussed, these incidents 
unfold in the context of a rising tide of racist and xenophobic rhetoric in, you know, across CARICOM member states, including in Guyana, as, as some of the case studies show. And so on that note, um, I don't think we have any other comments from our panelists, but I just want to say again, thank you so much for granting this hearing and thank you for standing in solidarity with Haitian people. And, oh, I and see I actually there's one panelist. Yes, please well, go ahead. I was not going to speak, but since there's time, I figured that we might as well um, say something. Well, I thank the commissioners for um, their time and for their deep understanding of the situation. Uh, there are so many contradictions when it comes to the treatment of Haiti. The, no country in the world is more deserving of asylum than Haiti. That is what is the paradox. The foreign media never pronounces the word Haiti without it being followed by the poorest country in the Western hemisphere. Haiti is defined by catastrophe, political instability, chaos, violence, natural and human made disasters in the Western media. But there is no catastrophe egregious enough to warrant the slightest bit of compassion for Haitian migrants, for them to be even treated as human beings. And I know that this is not the space for politics, but one of the most galling factors in this entire thing is that the US, the United States of America has maintained corrupt governments in power in, in Haiti for the last 65 years. And those governments have installed reigns of terror on the Haitian people, kept the country in poverty, chaos, violence, exclusion, no social services, everything that can possibly be accessed in terms of economic resources is embezzled. The US supports those governments. Right now, the United Nations is supporting a government that is financing the gangs that are terrorizing the people. The, 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 the representative of the United Nations went to the seat of the United Nations and praised the Fed, Mrs. Hélène Lalim, praised the federation of the gangs that are terrorizing the Haitian people. And when the people flee, because those are the people that are making Haiti unlivable for Haitians, and when the Haitians flee, they are deported in the most inhumane manner. It's as if they know that Haiti is exploding. Haiti is a volcano and they round up thousands. I mean, beside the 21,000 that were deported just since the Del Rio incident and all countries in the region jumped on the bandwagon, Bahamas, Dominican Republic, Cuba, Everybody jumped on the bandwagon it's as if it was a green light to abuse and deport Haitians. And as one commissioner recognized, a lot of these Haitians have been living in those countries for decades, living their lives, earning, being useful um, contributors to society. And they're just rounded up on the street, thrown in the back of pickups. They, their families don't know what happened to them. They cannot even make a phone call. And they're, and they're deported into a situation that everyone knows is unlivable, is an exploding volcano. And the worse the situation gets in Haiti is the more the deportations happen in, in, in the more inhumane and cru cruel manner. Um, and, and the commissioner, um, uh, what, what was the name, Clark, uh, recognized and, and you know, mentioned the historical discrimination against Haiti. And as Gerlin said, because Haitian people are not supposed to exist because they represent black liberation, black freedom and black emancipation. And for 218 years, Haitians have been exploited, degraded, demonized. <laughs> uh, and, and, that's, and, and when you see the red carpet, being laid out 
for Ukrainians, for Afghans, for Venezuelans, for any other nationality, you realize that those organizations know what to do when they want to do it. They can do it. Now everybody's bending over backwards. They don't know what to do anymore. The US is printing money to aid, aid the Ukrainian refugees. They're gearing up for 5 million refugees. But 20 or 100 Haitians <laughs> land on the coast of, of Florida and they round them up and dump them back into the volcano. So even the, the, the UNHCR discriminates against Haitians because they know the situation and they do not do their job of extending the protections that they were created to, to, to provide for the Haitian people. So we, the, the, the discrimination, I will even say the hatred because I don't know where it comes from, but it's, it's almost like a hatred of Haitian people is so blatant and, and, and cruel that you know, everyone knows it and everyone sees it and there is nothing, no amount of human suffering in Haiti elicits the slightest bit of human compassion. I don't know where it comes from. It is a very tragic and hurtful situation. And what we ask of you, commissioners, all of you who have spoken show that you do understand and you do, you are aware and you do realize the, 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 the depths of inhumanity that um, these people, that, that, that Haitians are subjected to. And, and, oh, and there's one, another thing that happens again. The depths of depravity that human beings go to when they know that a group is, is vulnerable is just unthinkable. The violence, the beatings, the rapings, we've heard about all that. And the state actors, we've heard the non-state actors, the state actors who chain people and treat them like criminals just for crossing a border. And what happens throughout Latin America and the region is that very often they will make the Haitians work for months and not pay them. And when, and for slave wages that they accept to work for because they're so desperate. And when the time comes to pay them and the Haitians go and claim their salaries, they call immigration to deport them. And so because they know that the Haitians are, 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 are vulnerable and, and fear deportation, they get that kind of abuse. They are made to work as slaves, literally. And the ones that are being treated that way in the Dominican Republic, they built the economy of the Dominican Republic for the past hundred years in the batteries of the plantation of the cane fields. They support the economy of the Dominican Republic. They work in construction in the hotels. The Dominican Republic dumps the majority of its production on Haiti. They, they, the, the whole economy of the Dominican Republic rests on Haiti. They get the biggest contracts from, the, from corrupt Haitian governments. And yet they go around the world talking that Haiti is a burden, Dominican Republic, that, that, and, and they mistreat Haitians. And we've heard all the testimony of the egregious mistreatment of Haitian Dominican Republic for the past 100 years. Now they're deporting people who've been there for 20, 30 years, who are born there, who are not even being given the, 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 the who, they have the nationality, they're being denationalized. And the last word I want to say is that I've been watching the news in Ukraine and the, the image of the pregnant woman who, whose building was bombarded and it was taken out on a stretcher has become the emblematic image of the world that I'm sure that image is going to win prizes throughout the decades because people are so outraged that a pregnant woman suffered from a bombing in Ukraine. And that has been on the cover of every newspaper and every magazine. But the thousands of pregnant Haitian women who are being treated like animals, pulled out of hospital beds, thrown in the back of pickup trucks, 
beaten, insulted, made to sleep on the floor with feces and thrown over the border like garbage doesn't elicit the slightest reaction. No one bats an eyelash at the suffering of Haitian people. So you are our last hope for a modicum of humanity to be shown to the Haitian people. Thank you for your time. And thank you for your understanding. Muy bien, muchas gracias. Y thank you very much. I thank your participation. Uh, Commissioner Clark had uh, requested the floor, so I give the floor to her. Go ahead. No, no, you hadn't? I, Commissioner, I don't think we have time. I, I, I just may maybe make a comment and uh, maybe the, for the colleagues to think about it. I was wondering in relation to CARICOM countries, whether or not the civil society organizations had considered um, going to the CCJ for some guidance on the revised treaty of Chagaramas and its interpretation. Just a, just a question. Um, the short answer is yes, and we will update you. La on respuesta corta es sí. Les vamos a brindar actualizaciones en, en el futuro con respecto a las acciones que hemos tomado. Perdón, que no hubo traducción de la respuesta. I'm sorry, there was no translation of your reply. Could you repeat very briefly? I don't know if the audio is is oh, okay. functioning. Let yes. Let me try again. Let me say it again to see if the translation works. Uh, the short answer is yes, and that we will update the commission on the actions that are being taken when, when we're able to speak about them. Muchas gracias. Pues, Thank you very much. We have reached the end of this uh, hearing. I wanted to repeat the thank, the vote of thanks for your participation, for your very valuable contributions. This is a dramatic situation, and this creates an enormous commitment to be uh, there to work, to visibilize, and to uh, act on the different lines of actions and measures so that the treatment towards Haitian migrants goes from a cruel, deplorable treatment to the respect of the dignity of each person of the world. This is a commitment of the whole of the Inter-American Commission. So thank you very much and let me adjourn this meeting.